Last year, I attended Christoph's presentation on diving, and I realized that a lot of people didn't know how to edit videos on OpenBSD. So, we decided I should show you how to edit videos on OpenBSD. Um, I think a lot of people expect they're going to use some bubbly, complicated graphical program to edit videos, because that's what a lot of other people do. But I don't like that type of software because I'm bad at using the mouse and like you need a graphical interface and they're so annoying to install and so many reasons. So I just use the same normal software I usually use, um, portable Unix-like software with free licensing compatible with OpenBSD because it's the easiest operating system. Um, when you think about it this way, well, if I do it this way, I think about it like how I use any software. I have a bunch of things I want to do and I have... Um, small modular components that do the things. So I'm going to show you, uh, start with the most essential op video operations and show you how to do those, and then we'll start building up. Each operation is pretty much going to be a shell command. Uh, and um, yeah, that's enough, enough uh, overview for now, I'll say more later. So the first operation is get the video somehow. You could use the, pro the program video for this if you have the video camera connected to your computer and you're going to you're going to press the video you're going to run the command and that's going to start recording the video i usually don't do that i usually record it on a camera separately and then copy the file or actually i have someone else record it on a camera i don't like i don't actually i don't necessarily have my own camera with me half the time i'm using someone else's camera anyway so i well however you do this either way you use one of these two options the um, video com uh, command, or you copy the file from another computer. Then you have a video file on your computer. And now you can play it with a video player. One thing you might want to do, one simple edit you might want to do, is to turn a long video file into a short video file that has only the parts that you care about. You can do this with, F well, I do this with FFmpeg. And I use a command of this format. I say the input file is the input file. I'm going to start um, from a particular time. And I'm going to go for a particular duration. And the result of that will go to this output file. For example, well, input file is that. Start time could be like three, eight seconds. Duration could be two seconds. And that would this would save seconds 8 to 10 to the output file. Um, now, uh, I actually, how do I do this? OK, I, liked, I, I actually prefer to specify, wait a minute. Back to this overview of how I think about the video editing. Every operation I have, I think of two things that I want to do. One thing is, once I've specified my video, I'm going to run make, you'll see later, and that'll build the video. And in there, it runs this command. But also, I, I need to be able to um, decide what should be the start time and what should be the duration. And it takes me a several iterations to figure this out. So I need a convenient way of specifying the start time and the duration. And for a lot of the uh, operations I'll show you, I'll show you both the, the core command and some wrapper that I made to make it easier. So I made this wrapper for cutting fi uh, files. You use it like this. Um, you give it the output first. I don't remember why. Maybe it's because I was using make, but I don't see why I do that, but whatever. Apparently, I give it the output first, the input second, um, then the file. Uh, I think that's wrong. Yeah. Um, anyway, the output, then the input, and then the start and stop time. And then um, you can ignore no copy. I'll tell you about volume later. But the point here is, um, oh, actually, maybe file. OK, ignore this one. We'll focus on this one. 
and we'll ignore this. So we're really only looking at this. You have the output file, the input file, the start time, the stop time, and the volume. So the first change I made was instead of specifying start time and duration, I wanted to specify start and stop separately. Uh, and then this program will convert it into start time and duration. The other thing this does is adjust the volume. So it does more than cutting. But um, we'll talk about volume later. Uh, now, the reason I want it to be start and stop is I can now I can play the video in mPlayer or MPV or something and look at the um, okay. I can do I can play the song and at the bottom I can look at this um, I can look at this and then I can copy that to the file. Why is it not playing? Oh yeah, yeah. So then, like, let's say I want to start the cut here, and then I'm going to copy 18. And actually, I can copy this whole thing. The program parses it properly. And then I, or maybe FFmpeg parses it properly. And then let's say, here's the end of my, my cut. Now I'm going to copy this. And then that'll go into the file where I'm calling cut.sha. Okay, uh, let me review quickly. First thing is to get the video somehow, you can use the video command or you can copy it. Then cut the video. And then the other very essential thing, can you, I guess you can't really have very essential, it's either essential or not. So the other essential thing is concatenating video. I'll show you another way to do it, but for now here's a simple one. This is an excerpt of a make file. And this says, we can ignore this. Um, this is the output file. And the input file is what is that? The VTT is related to subtitles, but the point is the command is MKV merge. It's pretty simple. I think it's just you give it the output file and the input files. So now we had. Um, recording video or copying from camera, then cut the video and then concatenate video. And that's, um, I do things with audio and animation and um, subtitles, but sim just of operations and, and, and like re like encoding video, but just of operations of that like, uh, I, I, I personally don't use any like transitions or anything, so that's all I do that's kind of videos, pretty video specific. So now I can show you one video that has subtitles and audio, but the video type operations are just cut and concatenate. And oh, I'll put the microphone near. The I'll use this example a lot because it's like the main video I make. They're um, myself narrating different tongue twisters, uh, different tongue twister scenes in different languages. You'll see what they mean if you go to the website. You can check the subtitles, or I'll switch languages at some point, and then you'll you'll see the maybe I'll switch it to English, and then you can see. Oh, yeah. So the point here was with just these commands, um, with record a video or copy it from a camera, then FFmpeg to cut it, and then MKV merge to concatenate, you can create a decent video. Um, another thing you might want is subtitles. And here's how I do my subtitles. I made my own format. I have each subtitle on a line. Let's go to the... the um, Pickled peppers one. That's the example I have. Where is it? Well, I guess I'll just have to play. Here we go.
and you saw the subtitle switches, picked a peck of pickled peppers. So each of those corresponds to one line in the file of the text. And then I have another file of the timings, where the first two are for the first line. So Peter Piper starts at 3.1 and ends at 4.6. Picked a peck starts at 4.6 and ends at 6.3. And of pickled peppers is this duration. The one benefit of doing it this way is I can write this file separately from this one. Every time I do a translation, I make a copy of this file and, well, I use actually several different interfaces for making translations, but you can think of it as I make a copy of this file and I just translate each line at a time. But I don't have to change the timings file because it just uses the same timings as the original. But, um, yeah, so that's how I might edit the text without editing this, the timings, but now I'm going to show you how I edit the timings independent of the text. I have this program. Um, when I'm, make, when I'm t putting in the subtitle timings, what I do is I play the video, and then I press a button every time I want a uh, subtitle to switch. And the button actually is Y. So I I run this I run this uh, timings.sha, and it, it calls MPV. MPV is a fork of M player. Uh, and it does it at slow speed and it starts paused and whatever. Um, so then I start playing and then when I want the subtitle to begin, so at 3.1 seconds in this case, I pressed Y and then this video kept playing and then when I got to 4.6 seconds, and that would be when I wanted this subtitle to come out. Uh, so I pressed I pressed Y there, and then and then right when it switched I pressed Y, and then right when it closed I pressed Y. I did it before I had the subtitles, and that's how I knew that's how I was able to establish those numbers as the the exact times when the subtitles should come in and out. So the the results of um, what this what this does, like in more detail, um, the what does this do? I think this is um, a vestigial uh, line that made sense before. Okay, um, this set. MPV, you can uh, run Lewis scripts, and so this um, runs a script timings.lua, and it passes the subtitles file as a, as a parameter. Then this is the Lua file that gets run. It gets the parameter of the Lua file, it opens the file, and every time that, um, every time that the Y key is pressed, it's bound to the to the function sub in. So sub in gets executed and it gets the time position of the um, video and it writes it to the file. So that's how when I'm playing this video, I press the Y button whenever I want the subtitle to start or end, and then it gets written to a file of this format. And then actually, after that, I still edit the file and tweak it a little bit. But that's a good way of getting started. So now uh, I will review what I said earlier. I was originally talking about um, cutting video. I said, this is the command I use to cut video, but it's not the most convenient way for me to specify my cut points. So I wrote this other program. Same thing here. The way I, this is the way I, um, I save my subtitles. This is the way I want to uh, save my subtitles that I want to reprocess them regularly. But when I'm first creating a bunch of subtitle timings, it's not convenient for me to edit in a text editor. It's most convenient for me to use this um, MPV with the Lewis script. Um, and then 
the so one more thing about subtitles. I ch I get a little crazy with the subtitles. I have the um, I have tongue twisters in many different languages. Some of them only make sense in dialects, and I have them translated to many different languages. And it turns out the ISO and IETF standards for languages are not adequate. Instead, I use Glotto code, uh, Glotto log, and an identifier in Glotto log is called a Glotto code. So Macker 1271 is the Glotto code for English. But um, And, well, there are not a lot of nice things with that. I won't go into such detail. But now you see what I mean, what, what, what it means when it says Macker 1271 and Baba 1246. I said earlier, I have this, this is a file for the text. This is for the English text in Latin script. This is the Bavarian text, or maybe uh, Swiss German, um, in uh, Latin script. This is French. This um, this is Serbo-Croatian in Latin script and in Cyrillic script. And then my um, when I build the video, it's set up in such a way that I can build uh, a separate subtitle track for each of these. So the, what we've been playing so far was the original language track, but I'll switch it to English. And then you can see, uh, start from the beginning. Yeah, and I can switch to Serbian or French. Oh, that one doesn't have a French translation. This one also doesn't. Well, you get the point. So we went over the essentials of creating the like recording the video, copying the video, then cutting the video, concatenating the video, then subtitles, then the translations. Okay. Now another thing, um, another thing you might want to do that I don't. Uh, well, no. Another thing you might want to do is make animations. Instead of starting with a recording, start with nothing. Um, I'll show you some. I'll show you some of that. Basically, well, what I always do with that is I create a bunch of text, uh, create a bunch of image files in a separate program, and I number them like 000, 001, 002, and then I use FFmpeg to combine them. There are a couple other things that I don't usually do, but that might be interesting, so I'll mention them. If you wanted, for example, to create like here at the very beginning of the video, I just start with with myself there. But what if you wanted to have a title at the very beginning? Well, one way you could do that would be to create an image of the title. So, for example, just a black screen or a black screen with text on it. You could do that in Image Magic, and then you could turn it into a video format with FFmpeg, and then you could concatenate that to your clips that you've you know all the methods we discussed earlier. Um, yeah, so now I'll give an example of this one. I'll show you, I don't have an example of these two, because I don't do them that much myself. Um, you can read the image magic documentation for how to create the image and then just use the same method I'm going to show you right now. But I'll show you how, like some ways of converting still images to video. Um, let's open... Um, oops. I had it later in the file. That's right. Here we go. Um, okay, this is intended to be... This is a... The call is embedded with an R, so I'll remove the R formatting. Um... Okay, oops. And Okay. 
Okay, it would be something like this. The second and um, okay, this says we're going to combine this audio file. with and this is the vi this is the images that will form the video file it's the images named three a number with three decimal places so like zero 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 one up to nine 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 and everything else says it's going to be this particular um, color format four frames per second um, this is the um, what is it called? Bitrate, the the number of audio frames per second, and um, yeah. So if you want to make, make an animation, you make a bunch of. I happen to put in the video, the audio, but you don't have to do that. You make a bunch of. Im I make a bunch of images with this no uh, naming scheme, and then I combine them like this. If you want to generate them like in R, like I do, well, you can you can shell out from R to do this. Um, or sorry, you can generate them in whatever language. You can generate them in R, like I do. You could generate them in Image Magic, and that's how I would do it if I needed just a black screen with text. Okay, now I discussed basic stuff with video and animations and subtitles. Another thing you might want to do is to separate the video and the audio, and then do some processing separately on the two things, and then put them back together. Um, okay, yes, and I did not have an example of this ready, but um, when I did it, bef so I would use FFmpeg to separate the tracks. You could you could do that like this. Uh, well. Uh, for example. That would get you the wave track out. Um, then you'll process the audio with something else. I, for one thing I did, for example, was I had a noisy background, so I cut out two sections of audio: one with the noise and one, one with just noise and one with noise and speech. And then I used socks, and I was able to specify to. Um, Based on the noise, based on the just noise clip, I was able to remove noise from the other clip. But I couldn't find that right now, so um, just know that socks can do that. So what I did is I separated the video and audio tracks like this. Then I did processing on just the audio track. Then I combined the tracks together, and it'll depend on the exact encoding and stuff that you're using. But the command of that for that will be sort of like this. The important parts are you have this is an this is one input. And this is another input. And then the rest is specifying the details of the encoding. But yeah, so you'd have one input for the video, one input for the audio, except here it's a PCM file. You, you could have a WAV file, that'd be a little easier. And here it's a bunch of PNG files, but it could be just a, the video that you separated before. OK. And this, so start with the video file somehow, um, cut it, concatenate it, process audio. Maybe you split up the audio video separately to process the one of them separate from the other. Um, you have subtitles. Now it's getting a little bit complicated. Now it becomes important to discuss a little bit more of the composition of clips. I actually have two ways I do it. I showed you the simpler one, which is MKV merge. Simpler is not the right way to say it. The one that has a short, the, the command is um, easier to type. And MKV merge will um, deal with inconsistencies in format, and I guess convert it to MKV. I don't actually call these commands that often. I write them in a make file, and then I execute them once in a while, so I don't remember exactly how they all work. Okay, so that's one way you could do it. Another, and, and it works if the files are, they, they can be the same format, but they don't have to be the same format. 
You can do it in FFmpeg, and it's faster this way, but it requires that they be the same format. Um, here's the, the main command. This just says ignore standard input and say yes to everything. Um, I forgot what this means, but it's also like something that you can ignore for, for now for this part of the discussion. I so this is the main thing. The format is going to be the concat format, and we're going to take as input, uh, well, I call it a playlist. It's a list of files. The output codec is going to be copy, and then it goes to the destination. OK, so the, a way to interpret this is um, the input format is a text file. That's what the concat format is. The output format is whatever this says, but it's going to be encoded with the copy encoding, meaning that it's just going to, it's not going to re-encode anything. Um, this is the format of that input file. It's a file where each line is, says file, quote, and then a file name. And then those file names are the videos that we're going to concatenate. And you can see here why they all need to be the same format, the same encoding already. Um, now, since I have this here, I apparently use it somewhere in, in my project, but I forgot where. Um, yeah, anyway, so I sh showed two ways. One is MKV merge that does all the re-encoding uh, re that's not as fast and in a way not as flexible. But FFmpeg, I never figured out how to get to do what I want, so I only use it when when they're the all the same encoding. There are some other ways you could do this that are actually better. Um, because the way the way I prepare my videos is I I do a bunch of clips separately. Each tongue twister is a separate clip, and each tongue twister has its own um, local timings and text files for the subtitles, and those are all timed relative to the start of the clip. So it would make sense if you could instead of concatenating them into one video file and then adjusting all the timings to be relative to the beginning of the video file and this will have rounding errors. Instead of doing that, it would be nice to have a file format that would um, that would model this um, in, in a way that I find more naturally, that you have a bunch of different clips. Each clip is relative to start time. I'm told that Dash does this. And I think PTV does this. So I've been meaning to look at that, but I haven't looked at that. What I do for now, though, is I actually, uh, I, what I said, I make I make all the video files separately, and then I when I concatenate them, I add up all the the duration of all the preceding videos so that the um, subtitle timings are correct. Okay, now if we're dealing with um, th this is all like these examples here of concatenating and this issue I have with the subtitles. Those are all for this video where I have many different subtitle tracks, me speaking for a few seconds for each for each uh, subtitle, um, and then I'll have them translated every so often. And I'll like I'll meet someone who speaks whatever language, like you know Polish. And then Polish person will translate a bunch of uh, tongue twisters to Polish, and then need to reprocess everything based on that. So that is where it's nice to organize these. And I, I've done it a few ways. I'll show you a few ways to do it. For a very simple video, you can um, shell out from whatever programming language you're using. So this is the example I showed earlier. Uh, I make v music and videos in R, which is a programming language. So um, this is like the final rep R representation of the music, and then I use this command to write to the audio file. And then I use this command to write to the video file. And I just put this in some function in R, and I call it just the right time. And so that's that's how I organize a very simple one. And you can see here one nice thing about it is I'm able to coordinate the the frame the frame rates the second variable and the FPS variable um, 
I'm able to coordinate between the audio and the video by just having them as a variable in R that I pass to um, to the video here, and it's passed in the audio, but not during this command. It's in this. This has this um, object called wave, and in the creation of wave, it, it uses this argument second. So that's a simple way. Um, for my tongue twisters, I have uh, currently make files, previously uh, bespoke Python build system. In the future, it'll have to change. But this is the pretty much the, the root uh, make file. Um, this was kind of inspired to me by ports, where I'm using each make file as a configuration file. Actually, let's show one of those. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's not a good example. So th this is just the bare minimum, but let's give one that's um, Peter Piper. Yeah. Now here, this is equivalent to like, you create a new directory for a port, well I create a new directory for my tongue twister. And the make file here says, doesn't say very much, because Oh, I remember now. I've um, it used to say a lot. I haven't worked on this project for a couple of years. Uh, it, they it used to say a lot more, but I've actually um, factored out a lot of the, the um, a lot of the make files. So the make files are actually quite short. One of one of the things I do now is I have this f separate file for the languages. But um, I, so the point here is I, I treat the make file as a configuration file, and it includes this tongue twister dot make file, and that does all the interesting stuff. Here we go. And this is what I mean when I say it was inspired kind of by ports. Now this is the root um, make file, and it goes into each directory and sources the um, here we go. Includes includes the, the make files in each directory to build everything, but I can also build things for just at um, each tongue twister separately. This is a bad system for a few reasons, but anyway, this is how I did it. <laughs> uh, and one of the nice things is I have a, a, like consistent place to go for all the different commands I might want to run. I can build a website based on this. I can track my progress on working on these tongue twisters. I have a little task management built in. I um, I can make a diff I can um, export the trans translations and import the translations. And this is how I, if I'm having people help me with translations, I export them to a spreadsheet. Then we edit them in the spreadsheet, and then we import them from the spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, that's that. Now this this is uh, this is actually a bit complicated, and this takes the place of like the big. If you have some bubbly graphical program with lots of that takes lots of resources and have a bunch of different clips at the bottom of the screen where you can move them back and forth and stuff, this replaces all that. Uh, in doing this, I realized I uh, there are a lot of I I, I reached the limitations of make. And I and I liked this article by the author of by Neil Mitchell, author of Shake Build System, about the um, three types of build system dependencies, because it explained very well why I was running into an issue with Make. Uh, there are static dependencies which are available in every build system. So if you use Make, you've used static dependencies. The dynamic dependencies are um, let's see, how do I explain this? I think it's, for, for example, you might depend on a file, the input might change depending on whether a file exists. For, uh, if I have, um, if I create a new 
translation, then the file now exists, then I have to reprocess. But now if I delete that file, I should also, um, I should reprocess because now I don't have that translation anymore. The way make is set up, it doesn't know that the file has been deleted. It just knows that all the files that it knows about are, um, are, are up to date. So make a build the build the whole video with all the files. Now I delete a bunch of the files. All the file all the dependencies are still older than the uh, than the destination. So make would think, oh, this doesn't need to be rebuilt. But those um, those build systems that support dynamic dependencies will have a way of keeping track that. Um, these particular files were used as dependencies during this build, and that the next build has to take that into account. And then the multiple outputs from one rule, I think actually there are ways of setting it in certain makes, and I always mess it up. Maybe it's that, I forgot what the problem is, that like, um, it, I don't know, it doesn't do the dependency graph properly for this, but I, I, I didn't, I always had trouble with that, and uh, so, I've been thinking for a while about switching it all to Shake and thus using Haskell as the glue language, because Shake is um, is run within Haskell. But in the meantime, I came up with hacks to get around this. So because Make does static depend dependencies, to get the dynamic dependencies, oops, what did I do? To get the static dynamic dependencies, I add as a new node in the build system. Um, one of the dependencies is a file that lists all the dependencies. And then mo for multiple outputs from one rule, I forgot how I deal with that one. I, yeah. But then another problem is because the dependency graph gets rebuilt every time and it's kind of slow the way I do it in make, um, it takes a really long, like it takes several seconds to, to just evaluate the dependency graph. And I would like for it to go a lot faster. Anyway, um, but however you do it, I, and before this I had a bespoke Python build system. However you do it, the point is, uh, need some way of organizing all this stuff. If you do it in something kind of, kind of uh, with standard interfaces like make or whatever, shake, and then I have Haskell functions, then now your video is just normal software. It doesn't matter that it's video. So this is how I can integrate my video editing with, for example, my planning of the tongue twisters. Like I have a list of this tongue twister requires this prop, and I can link it to the video, and then I can build the the website based on the video edits. And actually, then I copy that to the static website generator, and so this is the the nice thing about using modular programs with with uh, standard interfaces. And even in the context of video, this has been very helpful for me. Unix style programs are generally quite easy to port. Uh, well, it's a bit strong of a statement. One aspect of Unix style programs is that they're small, uh, you know, do one thing well, and thus they have they have as few like, they have fewer dependencies than if you had one program that did a lot of things and had a lot of dependencies for all the different things. If you separate them into different modules, then you only need dependencies for your module, and because I think of editing video as I need to do a bunch of these operations, how do I do each operation? Well, then when I need to port it to a new system, if the if um, I only need to support those particular operations that I need. And a lot of cases, for example, FFmpeg has already been ported to a lot of systems. So usually I've been doing the video editing on, on a ThinkPad X201 or X220. There was a time when I got um, nervous about airport security, so I was carrying around disposable Raspberry Pi 3. The idea being that I could throw it more likely give away the Raspberry Pi, then get on an airplane, then get a new one once I land, and um, rebuild everything based on a backup, or even best based on a micro SD card. Also, another time, um, I was requested to make a promotional video on Windows, because I had to use a particular computer to do it, and it ran Windows. I did not have administrator rights. But I was able, in all three of these cases, to use my same methods of um, record video somehow, and then use FFmpeg for all the editing, and use some sort of um, use Makefile or some other like uh, 
program to organize the different different commands. And this, I think, is a good time to uh, talk about why my way is great. Um, yeah, so I guess I already started talking about it. A lot of people use those specialized graphical editing software with lots of buttons and stuff, but mine's easier to port for all the reasons I just said. Because I don't, um, I don't use graphical interfaces just because I don't like them, and in this case I don't really need them. So I don't need to run X on my computers and I can separate parts of the process. One issue I've had a lot is I want to edit a video and I have my laptop and I want it to run faster than my laptop will run or I want to turn off my laptop or like I'm running on battery or something. So I'll edit the video on a server or like maybe I'm on a bad internet connection. I'll edit the video on a server. Um, maybe I copy some small version, small files to my computer to 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 check, but most of the stuff is stored on a server, and then I copy only the rendered version to my computer. You know, and that's just the point here is it's easy for me to adapt to whatever the situation is. Um, of course, free software is good, but um, I think one of the reasons why BSD is so good is that I think just it's in order for software to be good, it has to be made by unpaid volunteers or poorly paid artisans because once money becomes a goal there are too many too many business requirements that appear um, when when you're trying to maintain the illusion that your your company is the magic unicorn that's going to save the world you need to um, make it look like you're doing something special so you need to make your software difficult so that you require special skills also so you can maintain your, your monopoly once you supposedly get your monopoly that maybe you're never going to get and then you need to use a lot of workers because you need to make it look like your software is very impressive and challenging. So you need to design it in a way that has a lot of workers or you need to um, have incompetent people work on it. Um, or not to be, I don't mean that like the majority of software developers are bad, just that they're set up for failure. Um, also, you should make your software hard to clone because um, then then some other company might be able to copy it, um, and then you, you'll have trouble arguing to your investors that you're going to someday become a monopoly. So one way of making it hard to clone is to make it unnecessarily complex. Another way is to make it badly documented. And uh, this is just why BSDs have such an advantage over um, like most commercial software and probably all proprietary software, just that the incentives are lined up right. You just make it because you want it to work. Whereas if you're in a Usually, commercial interests. If you're selling, trying to become a software monopoly, you need to make it look all all this stupid stuff. And so that's that. But even if you're just working, like you you don't have ambitions of becoming a software monopoly of your own company, but you just work for for some company and you do software. It's important that you use software that that uh, is complicated and hard to use and um, breaks a lot because then you'll be working a lot because if you if you use software that just works like what I show you here then it'll just work and then you know it'll look like you're not working very hard because you're not so um, point of all that is uh, if you um, this stuff is good way of editing your own personal videos but if you're gonna like edit videos for work you should probably use something very complicated that looks difficult to use and breaks a lot and requires a very powerful computer and stuff like that. So um, I can. So then, uh, now that I've separated the like the two types of software I'm thinking about, the like good software you just want to work and the bullshit software that you make for work. Um, uh, I'll go back to video a little bit. Um, video editing is the same as any other software. Like I think of it as the same as any other software. The there's some specific details to video, but you have some inputs, you have some steps for processing them, you organize them into some, in my case, a make file, but some system for organizing them. As with any other software, you should prefer software with common dependencies, free licensing, easy installation. 
and that uh, respects unpaid volunteers because software developed by unpaid volunteers is usually better. Um, then, just like any other software, you're going to do some different things to your data. Figure out what operations you need to do the data and implement them as modules with common interfaces and then connect these modules because some of these um, implement these as modules with common interfaces you can use them as libraries that you include but because video videos take a long time to process you might also um, take that into account when you're developing the build system now I mentioned this because this is in contrast to the like big complicated bubbly video editing software that a lot of people use that you just think oh I need this a lot of people think how could I possibly do all this with like without a graphical interface on OpenBSD well the thing is most people use hardly any of those features um, so that's why you need to figure out exactly what video operations do you need to use and implement just those I spoke with someone who um, runs the runs a local TV station about what operations he used and like I showed you about I don't know like five that I use aside from subtitles uh, cut concatenate uh, maybe you count the video audio I guess I showed you two cut and concatenate maybe there's the video the audio there's adding some animations some text I spoke with this guy who runs a local TV station he thinks we, we thought came to the idea that he probably uses about seven so that means implement twice as many little module modules for video editing combine them in a make file and that's how you can do video editing on OpenBSD.